Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last of the semester uh, to the Nemeki Alliance uh, seminar series. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our, our speaker today. Um, Mike Menzel is, has 39 years of experience in aerospace, working in industry commercial defense systems for NASA for the last 16 years. He's an alum uh, from MIT. Uh, and he did his bachelor's here in physics and his master's in physics from Columbia University. Uh, today, he's going to be sharing with us the, um, sort of the, the work, the, the lead work that he's doing on the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is on schedule to be launched soon, uh, coming in 2021, uh, and to talk about the, the various challenges, the engineering challenges that have had to be addressed uh, for this first of a kind mission. Um, so please um, ask your questions via the Q&A or chat, um, and we'll direct those to Mike at the end. Um, but with that, uh, Mike, thank you for your time and attention today, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, as I said, my name is Mike Menzel, and I'm the uh, lead mission systems engineer uh, for the James Webb Space Telescope. If you go to the next chart, uh, let's see. The um, James Webb will be the NASA successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It's going to be a six meter infrared space telescope. It's designed to operate at the Earth-Sun uh, Lagrangian point, the uh, second Lagrangian point. It's a collaboration between NASA, uh, Northrop Grumman and US con subcontractors, the European and Canadian space agencies, the Space Telescope Institute, and the uh, University of Arizona. And it's going to be designed for a 10 year mission. That's the goal, although we have a requirement for five years. So before I, I get started into that, um, I just want to chat a little bit about my career. As, uh, as Brian said, I graduated from MIT in physics in 81. Uh, I was hired as an antenna engineer at RCA Astro right after I graduated. And it turns out that RCA was acquired by General Electric and became GE Astro. And uh, for the first um, nine years of my career, I uh, ended up working on uh, five flights, which was quite a, you know, quite lucky for me. Uh, a lot of folks that go to directly to NASA don't get that, um, don't get that opportunity. Uh, I received my MS in physics from Columbia University. RCA sent me to school uh, to uh, for uh, in, sent me to school at Columbia. I told them that hey, uh, I want to be a radio astronomer, and by becoming a radio astronomer. That would make me a better antenna engineer. And uh, well, they believed it. Um, I took a new position in systems engineering at GE Astro in 1990. And that was acquired by Martin Marietta, which was consolidated in Lockheed Martin. So I worked for you know uh, four companies without really changing my seat. I, during this time, I was an adjunct lecturer at various colleges in New Jersey in astronomy, math, and physics. And frankly, aside from engineering, I have a, I have a love for teaching. and. Um, I, I dream of perhaps retiring and doing that. After the, uh, um, the plant that I worked in in New Jersey closed down, I took a position with Orbital Sciences as the director of systems in 1995. And then I went back to Lockheed Martin in 97 as a uh, deputy program manager for the Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions. Uh, those were the, uh, we trained the astronauts on how to service Hubble. Uh, Lockheed appointed me chief engineer for what was called the Next Generation Space Telescope, phase A study and proposal efforts in 98. And then in 2004, NASA asked me to be their mission systems engineer for what, what became the James Webb Space Telescope. And that's where I've been for the last 20 odd years, for over the last 16 years. And I've had the great opportunity to be able to say I've been working on this job from womb to tomb, which, uh, which has uh, a lot of advantages. So. The next chart, now I'm going to start talking. I'm going to walk you through the James Webb Space Telescope from the eyes or the perspectives of a systems engineer. And what do systems engineers do? Well, we, we look at the mission itself. In this case, we look at the science objectives for the mission. And we translate those into mission requirements, into a, a formalism that engineers can understand. After we write the requirements, we design the system. And that usually encompasses a lot of analysis or a lot of trade studies to define what each of the different segments or elements have to do. And while detailed engineering is being done to design those, systems engineers are usually putting together 
models of the system to, uh, to look at its performance. We'll be assessing uh, risk and that uh, matures into certain technology development. And then finally, once the system is all built and put together, we have the important job of making sure that the as-built system is worthy to fly and that's verification. So I'm gonna walk you through each of these phases for James Webb. The first phase, the science of James Webb, back in 95, uh, Hubble, uh, shortly after Hubble was up, scientists started getting together and asking themselves, what should the successor do? And there were four science themes that were developed for this future observatory. The first one was uh, they wanted to see what the very first stars in our universe look like. As most people are familiar with, scientists believe the universe formed about 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And you know, shortly after that in cosmic time, which is about you know, 300 million years, the first stars are thought to have turned on. And we wanna see what those first stars were. They might not have been stars at all. In fact, some astronomers think that they might've been uh, these black hole, high energy black holes, but at any rate, we wanna see them. The next thing astronomers want to look at is how galaxies evolved over the course of cosmic history. We know that galaxies near our own Milky Way, which are relatively, you know, the same age as the Milky Way, look like the galaxy up in the upper right, either spiral galaxies with a lot of order to them or maybe elliptical galaxies. At any rate, the morphology of these galaxies are pretty orderly. But when we look farther back in time, when we look farther away, the galaxies look weirder and weirder. They look more amorphous, like that picture that I show on the right. So we wanna see how the galaxies evolve from those amorphous blobs into the orderly uh, ensembles that we see today. Next, we wanna look in our own Milky Way galaxy and see how stars are born. And then there's a, a lot of exotic stuff that goes on during that birth, one of which is uh, sometimes we see these jets coming out of the, uh, where the star is actually being formed. And next, astronomers wanted to see how, um, how planetary systems may have evolved and uh, how, how the uh, uh, origin of, of uh, organic type species uh, like um, you know, oxygen or, or carbon dioxide and things like that came to be. So these were the four themes that they wanted the telescope to, uh, to address. And this was in 1995, but over the course of you know, 20 odd years, there's been a couple of new science questions, the most prevalent of which is to study exoplanets. The first uh, planet around another star was actually found around a pulsar, a very exotic object that represents the death of a star. And that was in 1992, and it was based on uh, timings from those pulsars. But then in the same year, the first exoplanet was discovered around a regular star, a star called FIFA, uh, 51 Pegasi. And that was based on radial velocity measurements. They actually watched the, uh, the gravitational wobble that the planet put on the star itself. But then in 2002, the first exoplanet detection was made by the transit method. And that transit method is, is, very, uh, is actually very neat and very uh, easy to analyze. The planet itself does a little eclipse uh, past the star. And as it does such an eclipse, there's a very characteristic light curve, a dip in the light from the star. And if astronomers look, start monitoring these dips, and they happen regularly at periods of around, you know, a couple months to a couple years, they get pretty sure that that's a planet. And based on that method today, we know of 4,000 planets around other stars. And it turns out that now that we have this new area of research, James Webb should be able to provide detailed examination of these exoplanets and may be able to detect biomarker signatures spectral signatures around these objects that may indicate the presence or you know, the presence of life. That is a big if among, uh, among astronomers, but uh, personally, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that it will be able to, to do such, such a thing. Okay, so as a systems engineer, we now know what James Webb does. We talk to the scientists and they've talked back to us. And so now it's time for the engineer, system engineers to start translating these science needs into, into requirements that engineers understand. So we have the, the, science, the science objectives, investigate the early universe at high redshifts, 
um, investigate star birth, look at first light objects, observe galaxy morphologies and exoplanet observations. So what does this mean to a, for a system? Well, this translates into the following top level requirements. We're gonna to wanna to do imagery and spectroscopy, and we're gonna to wanna to do that in the infrared wavelengths. Unlike Hubble, which sees in the ultraviolet and visible, to see in the early universe, we have to look in the infrared. Uh, most of the first light objects, when stars are born, they uh, emit a lot of ultraviolet radiation. But that short wave ultraviolet radiation from the early universe has been traveling maybe 13 billion years through a universe that has been expanding. And by the time that light gets to us, its wavelength expands from being ultraviolet to infrared. Next, if we want to see these objects that are almost by definition the farthest objects there are to see, they're going to be very dim, of the order of a, of a nanojansky. And if you want to know what a nanojansky is, well, I could tell you it's uh, a jansky is 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz. And if that doesn't float your boat, maybe a more concrete way of saying this is uh, take a child's nightlight put it on the moon and look at it from the earth. And that nightlight will appear to be about 20, nano, 20 nanojanskis in brightness. So that's, what, that's the type of thing that we're looking at. And that will demand high light collection. You're gonna need a big telescope. But more importantly, and I'll, I'll make this case in a minute, you need low noise levels. You need to have very low stray light. And we'll want to look at these things both in the near and mid infrared wavelengths. Also, we want high optical resolution, at least equal to Hubble, if we want to see the way these galaxy shapes evolve over time. And also, we'll need to take a lot of spectra. So we'll need multi-object spectroscopy. And finally, to see exoplanets, we need to see these very faint planets uh, near or around other stars, we will probably need to cut out the light from the star itself, and that's called coronography. These are the mission type requirements, and they further translate into what we got to build. The observatory will need near and mid infrared science instruments, both imagers and spectrometers. We'll need it to be at least six meters in diameter. The telescope and the science instruments will need to be cryogenically cooled. They'll need to have temperatures of no more than 50 degrees Kelvin because we don't want the telescope, the, glow, the infrared glow of the telescope to swamp out the faint stars we're looking at. To get good spectra, to get good optical resolution, the, ever, the error in the optical train can be no more than 150 nanometers and we'll need a multi-object spectrometer capable of doing 100 simultaneous spectra. And finally, we'll need a, a coronagraphic coron uh, 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 science modes. So this is how we systems engineers translated science into requirements. Next, usually, by, by the way, I'm always told never put math in a public presentation, but I don't believe in that. Um, usually, every systems engineer, lead systems engineer, has about one or two equations that drive his or her life. And this is the one that's been driving mine. Um, it's basically a signal to noise uh, equation. On the top is the signal, and that basically means, hey, get me a lot of photons. But what's more insidious for this mission is the bottom. And that's where you have the variance of the noise contributors. That is, in a sense, the, the noise of all the, of the stray light. And I use this equation to demonstrate to managers and others what the key drivers for this mission is. And one of the key drivers, this equation can be used to, to point that out very quickly, is not so much the aperture, which we all know has to be at least six meters, that's easy. The more insidious parts are the noise control, the stray light. And to demonstrate that, I use this equation to show managers and others what, what it is we're going to be looking at. This chart shows uh, pictorially what a uh, 10 nanojansky point source would look like if you did an exposure for 10,000 seconds. And to me and to most of the managers I show this to, it's as clear as mud. 
But the point source is there, right in the red circle. And the problem is, in order to see it, you have to subtract out the background. And the background for these faint sources is almost equal to the source themselves. And you know, we all know the challenges of getting statistical certainty from the subtraction of two large noisy numbers. It's very hard. So what this tells people and what it, it tells systems engineers right away is look, one of the real tricks to James Webb is controlling the background and controlling the noise sources. Make them as small, make those sources as small as you possibly can. And that's been one of the challenges of, of this mission. And by the way, that is also the, you know, the key driver that says the telescope and the science instruments have to be no greater, have a temperature no greater than 50 degrees Kelvin. And that has probably been the bane of all our existences for the last 20 years. Making a telescope this big in space that also has to be cryogenic has come with an awful lot of challenges. Okay, so you know we're at the point we've developed our requirements, and more importantly, we know which requirements are are driving. We know the important ones. Now it's time to start the the system design, and that system design usually starts off with a bunch of trades. And in the early days, we did about fifty trade studies, and I list them all here. And they came in all varieties. There were trade system trade studies, trade studies for the ground and observatory segments, INT studies. And then studies for the various elements, the instruments, the telescope, the spacecraft. And they were all going on at the same time. We had about 50 to 40 of these trade studies going on at the same time. And that is a, that's a, a pretty difficult situation because not all of them are independent. Sometimes the, uh, the best answer for one precluded options from, for another. And uh, it was the systems engineer's job, my job and my team's job to keep track of these. And I used a diagram similar to this. I had various tricks, but uh, we all viewed ourselves, or I viewed myself as kind of a flight controller with a bunch of airlines circling around me. I drew diagrams like this to uh, show how each of the, what each of the options of these trades were and how they may or may not relate to options in other trades that were going on. The other thing that we had to invoke or was that um, no single element or single subsystem would actually finish their trade. They would come to systems with their recommendations and we would look at, the, um, at that recommendation from the point of view of the system. If that recommendation precluded a better solution from another, uh, from another option or another trade study, we frequently didn't do it. The point was that we wanted to pick the options that were best from the system level and not best from a subsystem or element level. And so to do that, the, the drill here was for each of these trades to come to systems and say, here's, our, here's the order with which we, you know, here's our preferences. And we picked it, we ultimately picked the solution that best fit the system. And in the end, this is what we came up with. The James Webb Space Telescope, a six meter telescope, actually a 6.6 .6 meter telescope made from 18 individually articulated beryllium segments. Uh, the, um, on the back of the telescope is an integrated science instrument module that contains four uh, near and mid infrared science instruments. The telescope and the instruments are passively cooled by a tennis court size sun shield that you see there. And on the bottom, on the hot side of the sun shield, the sun facing side of that sun shield would be the spacecraft bus, which of all the parts of this mission is probably the most mundane of all of them. The, uh, the observatory is, you can see the dimensions of it, has to be folded up. And if you go to the next chart or the, the next chart, shows the, uh, the relative size of this telescope with me standing next to it, along with a typical five meter launch vehicle fairing. And at this time, five meter diameter is about the biggest fairing that, fairings that there are. So this makes it obvious that this telescope will have to fold up. And it folds 
by a series of articulations in those directions and gets to a configuration that looks like that. How does it do it? Well, it's a series of very complex on-orbit deployments. Uh, first, two structures that we call unitized pallet structures that actually hold the folded up five membrane sun shield fold down. Then two telescoping booms called mid-boom mid assemblies telescope out from the side and pull the membranes out. After they pull out, we have a tensioning system, which is essentially a, a series of motors and pulleys that pull each of these five layers taut. And then the telescope unfolds by a, a tripod that swings down to bring the secondary mirror down. And then two, uh, tele, two uh, wings that uh, rotate out, giving us the six meter objective, six meter mirror for the telescope. And I tell people that uh, this uh, deployment process will be over the course of about 14 days. It will be most likely the worst 14 days of my life. Um, at any rate, that's how we fold it on orbit. Aside from the telescope and the observatory, which has, was the real um, focus of most of the major trades, because it's where the, most of the new stuff really is, as a systems engineer, we also have to design the architecture. And the first thing we want to do is, uh, hey, what ground system will we use? Well, we'll use the same ground system that exists, the Deep Space Network and the Telescope Science Institute at John Hopkins. The launcher will be the Ariane 5 launcher. It's actually a donation from Europe, a donation in kind. And in return, we allow we uh, are flying um, two, sci two European science instruments. The launcher will put us in a direct path out to the uh, Lagrangian point, and the Lagrangian point is about a million miles away from the Earth, four times farther than the moon. On the way out, we will do the unfolding that I talked about. And during that unfolding period and the commissioning period, we'll be in constant contact with the, with the ground segment 24-7. After we fold out, we'll coast out to the L2 point and assume our operational orbit. And uh, then we'll start our five-year mission. Now, we, the requirement is for a five-year mission, but we have fuel and consumables to fulfill, hopefully, a 10-year mission. OK, well, that's how, you know, that was the system architecture and the design of the observatory. And while the, um, the telescope and spacecraft and SunShield teams are building the, the observatory, we, uh, we here at the systems are doing analytic modeling to make sure that the, uh, the margins that we have and the design that we have is going to live up to what we hope. The, uh, the prediction of certain on-orbit performance metrics can only be obtained by a, a set of complex, integrated, thermal, mechanical, and optical models. And I show some of those models on the right. They calculate things like image quality and image stability not only is the image good, but does the image stay good as we slew over the sky and experience a variety of thermal conditions? Uh, we need to make sure that we have the right on-orbit temperatures and the right cryogenic margins to give us the cooling that we want. Also, with, a, with a something the size of a tennis court, we have to look at the way we accumulate angular momentum and the way that the sun is trying to torque us. And also, as I said earlier, we have to have uh, good models for our stray light. And the interfaces between these models have to be specified. We have we systems call out what kind of consistency and accuracy accuracy checks that we're going to put on there. But a bigger systems issue that we have is, um, you know, we're trying to keep these models in sync with a design that is evolving, and that becomes a, a little bit of, a, of an issue. Running these integrated models in the beginning took about six months for each run. Later, we got it down to three months. So to coordinate things, we would do these runs in cycles. And between uh, a milestone like a system requirements review and a system design review, we generally have about four cycles where we would say, OK, freeze it. We're going to take the design as we got it now, run it. The design will continue to evolve, but those changes will put into the next cycle. But it was up to systems engineering to make sure that these things were coordinated. And you know, as a lead systems engineer, after each of these cycles, I have to report out on 
what our key performance metrics are. And, and, and that's usually pretty easy. Most of the metrics, you know, you can guess sensitivity, momentum accumulation, image quality, wave front error, things like that. I list them all on the right, along with in yellow, the ones that really relied on integrated modeling are there. And I have to rate given, you know, at any given time, I have to rate the risks associated with them. And for, mo for a lot of the more mundane TPMs, you know what the margin should be, things like mass and power. There's good historical records on those. But for a lot of the unique um, metrics like stray light, it's hard to know whether you have enough margin or not. So we actually use the models to develop sensitivity, uh, to do sensitivity studies where we put intentional errors in, uh, in materials and things like that. And we'd see how that affected our stray light. And based on that, we formulated how much margin we thought we needed at each part of the program. And those margins represented what we call reaction limits, where if we thought, fell below them, we'd know we'd have a problem. And I'd rate that as a yellow on the bottom. One of the other aspects that goes on, and this goes on uh, from the very start, is technology development and risk management. Um, Early on, when we started this, we knew that the Webb telescope would be radically different from anything that's ever flown. So we looked at developing right up front what some of the key risk areas or technology areas were. We knew we had to have high efficiency infrared detectors. We knew that to take 100 spectra of galaxies uh, simultaneously, we needed a, uh, a micro shutter array. It was actually a programmable array of slits and depending on what the galaxy field looked like, we could put a slit on a galaxy anywhere in that field and give us, and that allowed us to give the, um, uh, you know, up to 100 spectra simultaneously. We knew we needed a cryo cooler for one of our instruments. Uh, the tennis court size sun shield needed uh, special membrane materials. And we knew that our, um, our individual 18 segments needed a very good articulation system, as well as a large composite structure that had to be stable at cryogenic temperatures. So we developed these technologies early, early on. But even after you develop them, during the course of these, uh, you know, of a development, you always find new risk areas. And, you know, risk is an uncertainty with a bad consequence. NASA uses a one by five scale to, to rate risks in terms of their consequence or their likelihood. And as a systems engineer, you have to come up with, you have to look at these risks and, and work with the team to come up with credible mitigation plans. And they usually involve something like, hey, we're accepting the risk because we have enough performance margin to do it. Or maybe we have to transfer the risks to say, uh, hey, I'll, I'll, change this, but I'll accept a risk in some other part of the system that, uh, that I can control better. Or you can trade, do a trade study to get rid of it, or you could do research to find out how much uh, to, to actually decrease the uncertainty. And among the, the areas that we did a lot of research in was the folding and unfolding of this sun shield, which you know, can be likened to a parachute. You know, you, a parachute is one of these items that it's only as good as the last time you fold it, and you better make sure you fold it right. So we built a full-scale model of the sun shield, shown on the bottom there, and practiced how we would fold and unfold those membranes so they didn't snag. Okay, so the final act, uh, and probably one of the most insidious acts of James Webb, is the verification of it. In, in um. In Goddard, we have a philosophy saying, hey, test as you fly. You'd want, you'd want to take the, uh, take the system and test it in the same way that you fly. It. But for something like James Webb, that is just not to be done. And to demonstrate that, let's start with, we have the James Webb Observatory. It uh, has a six meter telescope. It has a sun shield that's the size of a tennis court. On the cold side of the observatory, you have temperatures of 50 degrees Kelvin. On the warm side of the observatory, you have temperatures as high as you know, 400 degrees Kelvin. How do you test this? If you were to test it as it flies, the first thing you need is another six meter telescope. And by the way, that would have to be another six meter cryogenic telescope. Well, then you wanna put these in a cryogenic chamber 
So you need a chamber that has a helium shroud and a, a liquid nitrogen shroud. But those shrouds would only insulate the cold side of the observatory. The warm side of the observatory would have to be more like, uh, you know, 300 or 400 degrees Kelvin. So you'd have to put in some kind of thermal blankets to keep the thermal photons from the hot side from making their way into the cold side. Next, this observatory is built for working in zero G. So you'd have to have all kinds of ungodly offloaders and those offloaders are gonna to have to go through that insulation that you've you know, worked so carefully to, to control. In the end, you know, build, getting a, a vacuum vessel and a system that could do this is just not practical. So testing this as you fly is just not in the cards. So we need a verification program that relies on analytic models. And these are the same models that we use to design the observatory. But the trick now is we have to make sure that the models are anchored or correlated to the as-built hardware. So we correlate, we would do tests for the, um, the spacecraft separately and tests on the, uh, on the telescope separately. We correlate their models, make sure that they, uh, they actually, the models actually predict the behavior of these things. We integrate the observatory together, the model of the observatory together, and use that to predict the on-orbit performance. Now, we still do observatory-level tests, but those tests are, are focused more on verifying that the thing was put together correctly, the workmanship is right, and that there are certain behaviors of critical interfaces that are not included in these other models, so we focus on those. So, you know, we adopt this kind of verification method for a large observatory like James Webb. And finally, I'll just close up with, uh, with some baby pictures. Where are we right now? Well, the telescope has been integrated for the final time to the spacecraft. And there, this picture shows the, 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 the telescope, the OTE mounted on the spacecraft with the sun shields fully deployed in tension. This next picture shows the telescope deployed. I don't have a picture with the secondary mirror deployed, but you can see the picture of the, uh, of the two wings along with the full aperture of James Webb. Next, after that, we folded everything up, put it in its launch configuration and sent it over to vi for vibration and acoustics testing. And it, it successfully passed the vibe test as well as its acoustics test. We send it back. And after this, we're going through our final deployments test right now. There is um, this picture shows the deployment of the uh, of the forward uh, UPS. That's the panel that holds the the folded up sun shield. And this last picture shows uh, where we are right now. Right now, we've just deployed uh, the uh, those mid the mid boom assemblies that'll come out. And now we're going to start the, uh, the final testing of how to tension the flight sunshield. So just some closing thoughts for me. It's been a long ride for me, but it's been, this is probably the job I've always wanted. Not probably, it is. Um, first, you know, it's just some closing thoughts. When I was a young man, when I was a teenager, the largest telescope on Earth was Mount Palomar. It's located in the hills of San Diego. It has a massive primary mirror that's uh, five meters in diameter, and it weighs about 545 tons. And when I was a young man, you know, as a teenager, I wanted to be an astronomer and I wanted to work on Mount Palomar. I would have never dreamed at that time that I'd be lucky enough to be on a team 50 years later that's building a telescope bigger than Mount Palomar. And it's not going to be located in the hills of San Diego, it's going to be located beyond the moon. 1.5 million kilometers, and uh, well, it will only weigh 6,310 kilograms, one one hundredth of the Palomar telescope. So in summary, uh, the James Webb telescope will be one of the premier astronomical tools of the next decade, and will address some of the most fundamental areas of astrophysical research. Uh, first stars and galaxies, star formation, solar system evolution, 
and it may actually get to uh, detect or uh, start to investigate habitable exoplanets. It's truly a first of its kind space observatory. It's offered the systems engineering team some very unique and difficult challenges, a uh, cryogenic design of a large space uh, observatory, complex on-orbit deployments and verification by analysis. It will rewrite the astronomy books and also the engineering books of future space observatories. And finally, um, I consider myself very lucky to be a part of this team and this program. And it's to have the pleasure of sharing our work with you today. And that's, uh, that's it for me. So I'm ready to take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you for your attention. Mike, thank you. I, I send you the, the, the physical and the, the virtual uh, applause. Uh, thank you for the, the phenomenal discussion and, and phenomenal work. Um, I feel lucky to have heard your, your words and your, your sharing today. Um, well, we have a number thank of, you. we have, absolutely. We have questions from the participants and I will um, shepherd those in your direction, Mike. Uh, but let me just sort of thank kick you. off um, a, a, a question of my own. Uh, I, I think I'm fascinated by the, the software tools, the analytic tools, as you said, uh, for the system verification. I wonder if you could just say a few words about how those same system so software systems are used in the operations. You know, once you have the as-built system out there, uh, are, are those same tools then used in the control, interpretation, um, sort of tweaking, if you will, of anything that can be tweaked? Or how does that work together after it's in the sky? Well, I yeah, it, it turns out, Brian, that, that that's, uh, you know, some people may say that I'm trying to, uh, <laughs> Cling on to my cling on to my position, but right now I'm discussing with our engineers right now exactly how to do that. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is uh, uh, make sure that we we NASA have efforts that will uh, uh, tweak those models based on our on orbit performance. Not only so that we get uh, you know we can use them as diagnostics for any problems that the telescope might have but also to find out how far off we were on guessing uh, how much margin we should have actually had. You know, we, we use these models, we nicknamed them um, our model uncertainty factors, our MUFs. And uh, we've taken some good, you know, we've tried to take our best estimates on how much MUF we should use on certain mission unique things like um, uh, image stability or, um, or, or, you know, thermal, cryogenic thermal margins. So I want these models to actually be used, uh, be tweaked for in using in-flight data to find out how much MUF we really should have used. Um, for the most part, the, the, after that, the primary source of the models will be uh, in case we have to do any kind of on-orbit diagnostic or you know, problem solving. So th that's the, the primary area of where, where we're gonna be focusing, where I wanna focus our modeling attention post-launch. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, let me start with taking some questions and, and participants. Thank you very much for the questions. We will not get through all of them, but let me try to um, pick and choose a, a few to address some common themes. Um, Mike, a, a, maybe a, a, an easy one to kick you off with. Um, when you look at a star in a faraway galaxy, are you looking back in time or, or forward in time? Oh, no, no. You're looking back in time. Um, you know, I have a whole set of charts for this, but uh, you know, when 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 you look at the sun, for example, which I wouldn't wouldn't you know adv wouldn't, wouldn't recommend, you're seeing the sun not as it is, but as it was eight minutes in the past. When you look at some of these near galaxies to the Milky Way, you're seeing them not as they are, but as they were, you know, some of them 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were on the Earth. So you're always looking back in time. Very good, thank you. Um, so this is related to um, you know potentially a mission out to the to the telescope. If the, cry the question is, if the cryostat has only a five-year supply of cryogenic liquid, presumably liquid helium, um, will there be a, a resupply mission or at the five-year mark or, or beyond? Well, first, there is no cryostat. We have a cryo cooler. So we're not limited. We are not limited by cryogenics that way. We have a cryo cooler, um, but we are limited by our fuel. We have 10 years worth of fuel there. And there are there are concepts for putting a refueling mission out there. Right now, you know, the concepts, in my opinion, are, are very conceptual, and I wouldn't be counting on them. So, you know, as part of our operations, one of the things that, that I want to keep an eye on is um, making sure that our operations folks, you know, um, 
look to conserve fuel to get the most they can out of this. But, you know, but by the way, the other thing that, that I, I run into when I get this discussion is people say, oh, you only have 10 years of worth of fuel. Well, you know, you have to point out to folks that no matter what, um, a very well-designed science instrument probably has a life of seven years. So even though that, you know, even though I say we're limited by fuel, let's face it, by 10 years, and, and I also want to point out right now, uh, our fuel reserves are such that depending on our launch dispersions, how much fuel we have to expend to, to correct the launch error, we, we, we'll be out, we have enough fuel for 15 years. But it's very doubtful that, the instru- that all the instruments will last that long. Very good, thank you. Um, so maybe some questions related to um, maneuvering and getting there. So is the telescope able to maneuver if needed to avoid collisions with other objects? And the parentheticals, how much time is it going to take to get there and get running? Yeah, um, let's see. First, getting getting there, getting out to the L2 point is easy. That takes about 30 days. But to gently fall into the uh, kind of a pseudo gravity well of a Lagrangian point, that won't happen until about 180 days. But we'll be out at that distance at 30 at, at 30 days. Um, as for hitting stuff, uh, it would be an extremely unlucky bad day to hit anything. So we're not we're not using our fuel to avoid collisions. That that's not the issue. We are using our fuel to stay in orbit around the L2 point. Uh, for those that might have taken you know some of this physics, the L2 point is what we call quasi stable. If you don't do little gas, uh, little uh, delta Vs, you will uh, you will fly away from it. So we do a, a delta V maneuver once every about 21 days, 22 days, just to keep the orbit stable in that. And um, I, I, does that answer all the questions for that, Brian? I, th- I think so, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, another maybe pairing of questions related to the sort of light. Um, what, one question is, um, is this telescope able to adjust for the light around the stars, the zodiacal uh, light around stars, will that be left to the physics researchers? And a sort of the common, the other question is how is straight light um, dealt with? Um, is it verified through analysis? You know, so how, how is the imaging done, I guess, maybe is the, the, the higher level question. Yeah, well, 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 actually, those are excellent questions. First, the stray light levels are done through, through analysis. And what we do is um, we put various shielding around the telescope to avoid certain stray light paths that might come in. And that analysis is notoriously complex. And and a second, when it comes to zodiacal light, that's part of the background that we live with. And what happens is when we take an image, we'll take an image of the star, we'll take uh, images of the uh, black background around the star and we'll subtract the two. The zodiacal light is part of that background. And to put that in perspective, uh, we've, uh, if we had no contributions of stray light from the telescope, you know, glint or whatever, for every photon that we get of near infrared signal, we get three photons from the, um, from the zodiacal light. So we, we deal with zodiacal light by subtracting it out. And it is, it is, it is a very big contributor to stray light. Very good, thank you. Um, I think this next question is maybe the thing that you said is gonna be the most stressful uh, days of your life. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the mechanism that will bring the six hexagons that fold the mirror uh, into perfect alignment? Well, actually, there um, each each of the first that that is that that's the least stressful part of my life because there's redundancy in that, right? For instance, let's say one of the eighteen segments just can't work. We can find a way to work around that and still get our mission. But um, for the individual uh, individual 18 segments, we have seven cryogenic mechanisms behind that, seven degrees of freedom. <coughs> they, those cryogenic mechanisms um, will uh, adjust um, the three translational degrees of freedom, three uh, rotational degrees of freedom, and a seventh that will actually give some limited shape change to each of those 18 segments. Those are the easy ones. Uh, a lot of the mechanisms that do the, um, the the unfolding of the membranes, a lot of those are are single point failures, and and there's no redundancy in them. Those are the ones that are you know are causing. Uh, those are the ones that we keep an eye on. 
And the majority of those are really like one-time release devices that, that, that will just, you know, um, we use non-explosive actuators for low shock and things like that. So they're high reliability, but, you know, we have to confess they are single point failures. Keeping, keeping fingers crossed and, and doing good engineering to make sure the fingers work. Yes, the best we can. <laughs> yeah. and, and, so, and by the way, also doing a lot of what we call failure modes and effects analysis. Very good. So let's um, take uh, one last question here. And uh, thank you participants for the very good questions. And we just don't have the time to get through all of them. Um, this is maybe a, a far reaching question, Mike. Um, what kinds of lessons are we able to learn or should we learn uh, from the James Webb telescope for the next generation of space telescopes like the origin or, or it, you, know, you know, similar missions or similar, similar things. You know, what are the, how do we carry this forward? What are you going to learn? Oh, well, 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 I'll tell you, first of all, and in all honesty, that is something that uh, after this mission's done, win, lose, or draw, people need to come to me and my team for this, and we will be writing books on this. Um, I've got a lot of, uh, I have a lot of, suggestions, but uh, one of them, you know, there's a lot of things on this observatory that could qualify as a gossamer structure. A lot of the, you know, dealing with things like um, the sun shield membranes and the way they unfold, they're, they're highly non-deterministic. And we've, we've learned some very valuable lessons. I don't have time to elaborate on all of them here, but we've learned some very valuable lessons on the kind of inspections or the type of precautions you could do in um, in unfolding and folding these type of gossamer gossamer structures. I think of all the lessons that that I've you know accumulated in this. Those would be the area that'd be the area where I would I would want people to come and talk to me about this. We've learned some definite do's and definite don'ts. The biggest one we we, we can learn you know, we did learn is hey you know make sure you build. Um, full scale models of these gossamer structures and really make sure you understand how they behave. That would be, that would be one of my, one of my bigger lessons uh, on this. Uh, I have a bunch of others that, that I would suggest, but I don't think anyone would trump that one. Oh, very good. We, we should, it sounds like we should also do a documentary, you know, on, on your experiences and the team and the, and the telescope, just to make sure that the, the lessons are captured. And I'm sure you have, more than more lessons that you can enumerate um, and think about it uh, right now. Oh, we 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 surely do. So I, I think with that, Mike, I, I want to again thank you for your time and for leading this phenomenal work, and thank you to you and to your team uh, and for joining us today. And for uh, participants, thank you for for joining and 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 asking your questions. Um, and this will be the last uh, seminar for this semester. Um, this is um, so you know, Mike gets to give the send us off to the holidays, um, and so we 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 are looking forward to welcoming you you back in in 2021 in our continually evolving new normal. The Mechie Alliance seminar series, as you know, is our way to engage with our on campus and off campus partners and community uh, to be able to bring to you speakers um, and discussions that are of interest to you. Um, so please, if you would like to nominate yourself or your colleagues or others, do drop us a line. Um, and we will be soon sending the, uh, a list of all of the various uh, speakers that we'll be having in the, in the spring semester. Um, but, but it's not full up just yet. Um, so please drop a note to, to Mechie Alliance at MIT.edu and, and we will work with you and your, your nominee to, to join us. Um, and I think with that, everybody stay safe, be well. Um, Mike, again, thank you to you and your team and to phenomenal work. And I, I look forward to seeing images and, and, and following the, the, the telescope as it's deployed. Um, and well, thank you, thank you for having time. me, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Very Mike. And, and thank you to Peter in the background from NASA for, help, for helping get the arrangements together today. Um, so great support. Have a great night, everyone, or day. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe, be well. <laughs>